delighted to introduce our next lecturer. Um, Andrea Molot is a civil servant and research scientist in the Global Modeling and Assimilation Office at uh, the NASA Goddard Flight Center. Her research focus is on land ocean uh, surface and boundary layer interactions. Um, and recently she has been leading the uh, GMAO efforts to release a uh, uh, chemistry uh, transport model called GEOS. Welcome, and uh, we're very look looking very forward to your talk, Andrea. Hi, thank you very much to the conveners for, for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, so far, the talks have been incredible. I'm looking forward to, to lots of interaction. Let me share my screen. Are we good? Yes, we can see it and it's, yeah. And it's not yet in full uh, presenter mode, but now it is. Thanks, great. Okay, good. So um, I am now the lead of the GMAO Seasonal Prediction Development Group. Um, here's a list of all the different people inside of GMAO that have contributed in one way or another to that piece of what I'm gonna talk to you today. Um, GEOS is the general name of GMAO's Global Earth Observing System model, um, and we have the GEOS S2S system version 3, that, that's our latest release. Um, and just briefly, I'm going to give you sort of my take. It's going to repeat some of what others have said on the scientific basis and the history of subseasonal and seasonal prediction. I'm going to talk to you about some of this back and forth between coupled models and coupled data simulation and motivations. Um, some of this is going to contain the justification for why we choose to run a full Earth system model for the subseasonal. And then I'm going to give you, get you a little bit into the weeds of what um, our GMAO <coughs> seasonal prediction model data simulation looks like. But this is, these are details that every, every system out there um, um, makes different decisions about. So in terms of the scientific basis, we know that the climate system is a force dissipative nonlinear dynamical system. And because it's chaotic, there's a finite limit to weather predictability, however. And this however is a, is a big piece of this. Tropical flow in particular are so strongly determined by the underlying SST that they show little sensitivity to changes in the initial conditions. We've also got this idea that the ocean and the land evolve more slowly. And so this extends predictability as well. And so basically, if we can predict the SST, we should be able to predict certainly the large scale seasonal tropical circulation, subseasonal as well. Um, and there are early studies that the SST actually depends not so much on the initial state, but on the overlying atmosphere. The key to this whole thing is the signal to noise ratio, as others have mentioned. And so that's, the, that's where this potential predictability comes from. Um, Scientific basis, a little bit more on seasonal scales, ENSO is the big, biggest driver, but there's other low frequency modes as well. Um, and the Atlantic SST is important as well. And the Atlantic meridional mode is a strong low frequency variability in, in the Atlantic. And then in terms of the extra tropics, it's mostly these canonical teleconnection patterns that you can find. This is one version of them that you could find you know, in, on a lot of websites. The CDC is where I got this from. Um, and then here's another diagram similar to the one that Frederick showed that just illustrates this idea that on, whoops, on the weather time scale, we can, the predictability drops off quickly 10, a little bit more days. But if you start taking weekly averages, for instance, on subseasonal scales, you get a little bump in prediction and that drops off. And then the seasonal, it's monthly means, et cetera. Um, so 
this is a, a little bit of my take on the history of seasonal prediction. Uh, starting in the late 1800s, uh, the Indi Indian Meteorological Department started to forecast statistically, obviously, forecast monsoon rainfall based on the Himalayan snowfall in the previous winter. Um, and then the Walker circulation and the Southern Pacific and North Atlantic oscillations. Again, statistical model to predict seasonal scale precipitation based on this. In the wake of the Dust Bowl, that was the beginning of some of the early funding. Uh, Rossby and, and Amias and others working on wave propagation. So that's the teleconnections start to, the extra tropics start to come into play here. Um, and then the El Nino stuff started in the international geophysical year. They noticed this seabirds in Peru and they started to get the idea based on these measurements that it was connected some, some kind of larger scale phenomenon. In the 70s, the Southern Oscillation in El Nino, the teleconnections, you know, things started to pick up. The 72, 73 El Nino was a huge uh, economic implications. And so the importance of being able to predict these things. Um, however, 10 years later, as it says here, the biggest El Nino of the century of the, at the time was going on and there was still no real consensus that it was even happening. Um, and then some of the early modeling efforts um, and then the research in the 90s started the tropical, focused on tropical SSTs. Now, these days, dynamical prediction systems have been operational. There are many global producing centers across the, the world and a few different multi-model ensembles as well. Um, one note here about what I'm calling the practicalities. Um, the big question is what is it that's predictable at seasonal or sub-seasonal lead times? Time averages, spatial averages, probabilistic measures. We need ensemble forecasts and it has to assess the reliability and that's this connection between your ensemble spread and your error. Um, you you wanna know that if your ensemble spread is small that you can trust that answer much better than if it's wide. Uh, calibration is the issue, the simplest of which is like a bias removal, but the calibrated forecasts are more reliable in this sense. Multi-model ensembles help. Um, I, I'm not convinced that I understand or that others understand exactly why the multi-model ensembles help, but it reduces overconfidence, which means I have a small ensemble spread, but I'm gonna make a big mistake. In general, this little diagram is starting to illustrate that the longer the lead time for whether we're talking about instantaneous, we get to sub-seasonal, we're talking about week-long averages that we need to look at, monthly for seasonal. And this is all about signal to noise. So a, a few ideas here about coupled models and coupled DA. The first question from my point of view is, I'm gonna show you an example of why we need coupled models to do sub-seasonal or seasonal prediction. And here's an example of a very high resolution simulation with the GEOS atmosphere coupled to the MIT GCM. Here's the specs for the, for the resolution that we ran this at. But there was a study, Strobach et al. 2019, published a paper that talked about a feedback mechanism. This is three to five day oscillation going on. So very relevant for subseasonal timescales. That's a an interaction between the ocean surface and the overlying atmosphere. Um, on the left is a diagram of the lag correlation, but on the right is the basic physics for the mechanism. Positive SST anomaly, it increases the instability, additional buoyancy, but that mixing dra drags high momentum air down to the surface. It accelerates the winds, Higher winds have you more out, outgoing surface heat fluxes, which tends to cool. Cool is more stable. It reduces the wind. It reduces the upward sensible heat flux. And, and this goes around and around. 
the lag correlation that that the, the signal of this in the lag correlation plot is that blue curve <coughs> from the coupled model that's showing negative correlations at negative lead and positive at positive lead. That's suggestive of an oscillation. Um, if you look at the blue, the green curve here from Mera itself, from Mera 2 itself, there's a hint of it, but it, it's not really cooking. And if you look at the red curve, which is the same model, but an atmosphere only version of it, you don't see any sign of this oscillation. So you need the coupled model to capture these interactions, even at short time scales. Why coupled DA? You know, we have well-established systems for DA in each, flu in each fluid, um, but we're not making the best use of some of the satellite observations that are sensitive to both fluids. We use altimetry for the ocean DA, not so much for the atmosphere. We use some of the scatterometers for the atmosphere, not so much for the ocean. And so the idea is that if we were doing this coupled, we could really um, make use of, of the data better. Um, other motivations for coupled DA is if you're running a coupled model, you got to initialize it from some spun up state, physical consistency, um, and also that the errors may be highly, highly correlated with errors in the atmosphere and the ocean, for instance. So um, I'm talking about coupled data simulation. And so I just want to give a little sense of what I'm calling the different flavors of coupled DA. Totally uncoupled would be each system, the atmosphere, the land, the sea ice, the ocean, running an independent data simulation, driving an independent model, making the first guess for the next independent DA. So everything uncoupled this way. Um, uh, something called weakly coupled is a, the essential coupling is through the model itself. So the data simulation is running independently for each system, but sorry, but those are being used to drive a coupled model where all of the, some, the components interact with each other and then use that to create the initial, the initial states for, I'll leave my hands off of it, for the next atmospheric DA or land DA. The strongly coupled, the gold standard is the data simulation and the model and everything are all running coupled. Um, but we need, and the, this could be called quasi strongly or strongly or different flavors have different names. Um, but for this, we need coupled error covariances and that's no small task. Um, and so I'm gonna talk to you all of that coupling, coupled DA sounds nice, but there are some cautionary tales here. Here's an example of cautionary tale with strongly coupled DA. And that has to do with you know, there's a lot of quotations here from a lot of different papers that are basically saying the, whole, the same thing. That's a nightmare, those coupled error covariances. Very, very difficult to estimate. And essentially, if you try to do it, you end up doing a worse job in some cases than if you just did the weekly coupled. So um, cautionary tale there. Um, another cautionary tale related to strongly coupled is also from European Center. And if you took a look at the left and the right, that's Cirrusat. It's, it's a weakly coupled or strongly coupled or quasi strongly coupled. You know, the flavors are all different. But if you take a look at the heat content exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is the black line, the coupled and uncoupled on the right is the ocean only uh, assimilation. They're very similar to each other, but if you look at the breakdown of what piece is doing what and what pieces of the budget are, are dominating in what place and things like that, we see very big differences. What's the correct? Um, not particularly clear from the ocean DA point of view. Um, I, going to give you an example also of what I call a cautionary tale for coupled modeling. Um, here's, here's from our system. Uh, on the right is the coupled, on the left is the atmosphere only, and here's the difference from in the, the cloud radiative effect at the surface. And so the first thing that we see is that the errors, the biases are quite different. Um, this one in the coupled 
where we have a very large cloud radiative effect has a particular uh, bad impact on the model. So what's going on here? Well, we figured out that this is related to the way the turbulence parameterization works. The turbulence parameterization in our system is sensitive to the near surface stability. And so the idea is that if the cloud effect is a little too large, just a little, the ocean gets a little too cold and it increases the turbulent mixing. And so you open this pathway for the evaporation to reach the cloud top and make more cloud. And so we increase the cloud and make more cloud and make it colder. And this spins away and, and gets us, when we first saw this, got us a cold tongue that ran all the way to the maritime continent. So these kinds of bad feedbacks, I would say, are, are possible. Um, and so let me switch gears a little bit and talk to you about our system. This is our system. We're not an operational center. And so in some ways, either people don't know that we're doing this or we have to kind of explain to you why NASA is in the middle of this in the first place. And the central motivation for us is to be able to have a state-of-the-art system that we can use it to demonstrate the use of NASA and other satellite data to improve subseasonal and seasonal forecast skill. And so for that, we have, we engage in the model development, the analysis development, the initialization strategy, coupled assimilation strategy. We also produce in near real time, uh, coupled DA and forecasts, validate and engage in some predictability studies as well. So this is, a slide with a lot of detail, maybe of interest, maybe not, but just a couple of things to point out. Our new system, we've gone to very high resolution ocean. We've gone to quarter degree ocean. 50 levels is moderate to low vertical resolution. Um, there's a new parameterization in there. I'll say one, one or two things about this, that despite relatively low vertical resolution in the ocean, it parameterizes the, the diurnal cycle quite well. Interactive sea ice model, we're running a weekly coupled DA. And so the forecasts and any retrospective forecasts are gonna be initialized from there. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we call what our flavor of that is. Um, and I'll show you a little detail about the, the observ observing system that we're using in the ocean. Um, and so this is a timeline because this reanalysis is going to, for us, is going to run from 1980 to the present. Um, and so this is in situ observations that go into the ocean analysis and the timeline. You see the huge kickoff that happened when the Argo floats kicked in. Um, and just a little bit of a geographical perspective, I'm going to run through a few of these quickly. Um, this is our in situ observations for 1981. This is temperature. Um, and so basically we're lock, looking at these expendable bathythermographs and the, the conductive uh, temperature density probes. Basically it's stuff that's being thrown off of ships. Um, and so you see a lot of the ship tracks here. Get to 1990, we see this density and we see some of these moored arrays popping up in the Pacific. These are the tower arrays. When we go to 2000, again, relatively the same density of the bathythermographs and stuff, we're starting to get a smell of Argo here, the green ones, and also the moored arrays in the Atlantic, the Parada arrays and the tower arrays. 2010, there's the Argo that's kicking in. And all of a sudden the coverage between here and here is like night and day. And the Argo are continu continuing to populate. So doing something in the eighties and doing something today are quite different in terms of available observations in the ocean. Um, and here's just a quick um, summary for satellite observations. Um, it's basically altimeters that we're looking at for the ocean. Um, when, I, when we look actually at some of these counts of the observations, this is the number of casts, hundreds of thousands. Atmospheric DA folks would, would have a heart attack with how few of these observations there are 
relative to what's available in the atmosphere. Um, so here's our flavor of coupled DA. Um, and so we're using its weakly coupled system. We're using the model, the coupled model to, to do all of the coupling. And so we run our coupled DA in two segments and two se sequences. One is this green line across the top. That's our predictor segment. That's just a straight coupled model forecast. Our data window is five days. And so it's a straight coupled model forecast. Along the way, we drop off what we call, these are instantaneous states of, so that we can compute the observation minus forecast. So this is the forecast every six hours that we're dropping off the sequence of O minus Fs. After five days of doing this, we collect all the O minus Fs together, do the ocean data simulation, ocean analysis itself, back ourselves up five days and compute, we compute a, a set of increments of this is how much the data is telling us the model needed to move or change. So with those increments, we run a predictor segment with all the increments inside of there. And that bottom one, that's our couple DA sequence line. And, and again, we do this for five days, kick off a bunch of forecasts, and then uh, do, it, do it, continue to do it forward. So everything here is done with a coupled model. Um, and so that's where the, the weekly coupled DA is coming from. Um, I'll explain a little bit of this also, but we're running uh, nine month forecasts. We're doing them every five days and the number of ensembles uh, I'll explain to you, but for the short lead times for the first couple of months, we have a 40 member ensemble and 10 members running out for the seasonal. Um, and one of the things also that's unique for us is we're running an interactive aerosol model with all of this, um, partly because we think that there's useful skill in aerosol optical depth or the pollutant PM 2.5 is the stuff that gets into your lungs. Um, it also under certain conditions may increase weather or subseasonal skill. <clears throat> you can think easily of the impact of dust on tropical cyclone development. Um, also in the aftermath of a large volcanic event and in general subseasonal forecast skill. So that's our motivation. Um, this is our AOD skill on the left and the PM 2.5 anomaly correlations on the right. Um, you know, in general terms, 81% um, <clears throat> correlation with observations. This is a little inflated because we're using MERA2 aerosol optical depth as validation, but that's analyzed in our system. Um, on the right, we can see PM 2.5 anomaly correlations, even up to a couple of months lead up in the 60s and 70s, which is certainly quite respectable. Um, I talked to you about this atmosphere ocean interface layer. Um, it, it really helps us with the vertical resolution of the system. So we went with this for our version three. And the idea is you're taking the top level of the ocean model and breaking it up into a cool skin layer, a diurnal warming layer, and then a decay down to what we're calling the foundation temperature. And so it, it allows us to capture the diurnal cycle. There's a tech memo, Akela and Suarez, that describes all of this. Um, one of the motivations for going to the high resolution, a few motivations for going to the high resolution here. This is the 50 versus 25 kilometer ocean difference in bathymetry. So you see that the bathymetry is deeper with the higher resolution. And it, it's basically, it's importantly getting us better resolution in some of the, the through flow areas, the Indonesian through flow, the Florida Straits, et cetera. Um, and so one of the other help that we get also from the resolution is resolving surface currents. On the left is the 50, the middle column is the 25, and on the right is um, observational estimates. And so you're starting to get loop current resolved here in Florida. 
okay? On the bottom, you're getting the eddies and the carocio um, that start to resemble, we're not getting eddy, we're not resolving eddies here, uh, we're not making any claims, but it's starting to look more like what we think it should look like. Um, also related to getting some of the through flows better resolved, the salinity is, is, is looking really nice. Salinity biases that we were getting on one side and the other, the Indonesian through flow are gone. It's helping ocean transport as well. Um, one of the other new, new elements that we have, and this is a, a, one of the, again, the motive, one of the motivations for, for NASA um, is assimilating uh, sea surface salinity. Our Maritu ocean system that's running now is assimilating sea surface salinity. For us, we were raining too much there, and so we were too fresh. The salinity uh, made it saltier, and it improved the um, mixed layer depth. And it, it ended up damping the propagation of the, um, the Kelvin and, and Rossby waves running across the equator and getting us a better um, El Nino forecast in, in instances of very strong El Ninos. Um, yeah, I'm just watching the time. Uh, motivation for the change in the ensemble strategy. We developed a whole new forecast ensemble strategy. Uh, the old system was under dispersive early, over dispersive later, meaning our, our error, our spread wasn't big enough early on and it was too big later on. Um, extra tropical skill was lower, probably because we had a small ensemble size. And the key to this here is, and I'll show you this in the next slide, we saw little evidence of additional skill from ensemble size beyond a few months. And so we saved a lot of time by doing this subsampling strategy. And so the first issue that, that changed is the forecast ensemble strategy. Our system now uses something that they call synchronized multiple time. Schubert et al. is a tech memo that, that lines out the details of this, but this sounds something along the flavor of what Joe referred to as the random field perturbation. So the idea is perturbations for combined forecasts are randomly selected from one day through 10 day differences in the atmosphere ocean data simulation states. The spatial structures turn out to be, and the tech memo shows it, closely related to the optimal perturbations that you would get from the singular value, singular value decomposition that Joe spoke about. Um, and we're presuming that they're sampling preferentially from the perturbations with the biggest growth rates, which is what you want. To show you what some of these spatial structures look like, we did a, some EOF decompositions. This is one day. And if you look across the tropics, it, it, it has the smell of something that looks like variations in the thermocline. Um, if you look at 10 day differences, we're talking about something that's starting to look like tropical instability waves in the ocean, because we do this both in the ocean and in the atmosphere. Um, the atmospheric states, one day you're looking at, you know, relatively small variations and small spatial structures. You go to 10 days, you're starting to look at something that may or may not be looking like a Julian oscillation near the surface in terms of the scales of the variation in the winds. Um, in the extra tropics, uh, if we look at here, we looked at the 450 millibar potential temperature. But again, at one day, we're looking at something that has a smell of synoptic scale variations. At five days, we're looking at something longer related to teleconnections. Um, the other issue with the ensemble strategy is the size. This diagram from Scaife and Smith illustrates very clearly the ensemble means skill as it increases with the number of ensemble members. Um, we were sitting down here someplace and our version three now is, it brings it up to 40. So this, we're expecting the skill to increase uh, quite a bit. Now, if we look at ENSO, almost every case that we looked at, looked at what we have here at the top. Here we have the, the, um, this is the RMS error. So this is skill and this is RMS error. So you want, it's a flip thing. We want RMS error to be small, but confidence interval 
with ensemble size, the confidence interval comes down smaller, but you're not gaining any skill by increasing much beyond five or 10 ensembles. Uh, every once in a while, we would see this where the RMS error would reduce a little bit, but almost everything was this. And so um, we decided that for ENSO scale beyond, beyond three months or so, we really only need 10 ensemble members. So to do that, we developed a subsampling strategy. The basic idea is that you run 40 ensemble members out for three months, do a clustering, pick representative numbers of ensemble members from each cluster and extend the forecasts out with a smaller sample. Um, so this has saved a huge amount of computer time. We're getting the whole data simulation and forecasts, retrospective forecast for 40 years done in about nine months time, largely because of this. Um, and we're running a lag burst ensemble. So again, if you can just think of these every five days, we kick off a, an unperturbed and a series of perturbations based on that random perturbation uh, method. And at some point, three months in, we do the subsampling and only a certain group of them are continued. Um, and just very quickly, um, these are the kinds of things that we have to look at in order to validate a system like this. Um, I'm a big proponent of validating the mean equilibrium climate of the model that we use because that for us is the saturation level of the error. We reach our saturation level of error in about five or six months. So for seasonal time scales, the equilibrium cl climate errors are the target. Forecasts, this is a little bit of a laundry list. There's a couple of things that we're looking at that are relatively new, the Genesis potential index, the cryosphere, the aerosol optical depth, <clears throat> and Frederick spoke about uh, sudden stratospheric warmings. We're also running with a uh, two moment cloud microphysics. So we have the aerosol indirect. And so we're also looking at a cloud drop number. Um, gonna run through this very um, quickly. So Andrea, um, could you wrap up so that there's some time for questions? Maybe yep. in a minute or so? Thanks. Yeah, yep. we're there. So I was just gonna kind of skip through this. Um, this is low frequency mode indices that we're getting. And if you look on the right in month two, the higher ensemble size really bought us some nice respectable predictability for some of these other modes. Um, we also look at the observation minus forecast from the ocean. Um, and this is basically it, the summary of the characteristics and evaluation part. Maritu Ocean is gonna cover 82 to present, public release middle of next year. We've started the calculation already. The upgrade in the ocean resolution really bought us a lot in terms of the transport and the salinity. Um, the glacial runoff is in the right place, the diurnal cycle. So, and we also have the, the salinity. Um, and the big change in the forecast strategy is lots of ensembles for short range and fewer for longer range. Um, and so, yeah. Thanks so much, Andrea, for this comprehensive talks and your insights about um, coupled errors and error propagation and how the different components um, in, impact each other. Mm -hmm.